JFT just fair and direct. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to JFD's uh, weekly market outlook webinar for the week May 11th until May 15th. I am Haralambos Pistros, senior market analyst uh, here at JFD, and I will describe the most important economic releases and events on the financial agenda for the week ahead. But uh, before we start, let's uh, read our disclaimer. The content we produce does not constitute investment advice or investment recommendation, should not be considered as such, and does not in any way constitute an invitation to acquire any financial instrument or product. I will leave you a few seconds to read the rest, and then we will start uh, our webinar. Okay, following the RBA and the Bank of England monetary policy decisions uh, last week, this week we have one more central bank on the agenda, and this is the RBNZ, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Although interest rates are expected to be kept unchanged at 0.25%, it would be interesting to see whether officials will decide to expand their QE quantitative easing program. With regards to the data, the US CPIs and Australia's employment reports, both for April, are due to be released, as well as the UK GDP, the preliminary UK GDP for the first quarter. Now, so today, on Monday, no major releases or indicators are due to be released. Those worth mentioning are already out. It was uh, during the Asia morning, we got Bank of Japan's summary of opinions from the bank's latest meeting while during the early European morning, we got Norway CPIs for April. Now on Tuesday, on Tuesday during the Asian session, we have China's CPI and PPI for April. The CPI rate is expected to have declined to 3.7% year over year from 4.3%, while the PPI rate is anticipated to have fallen deeper into the negative territory. Specifically, it is expected to have fallen to minus 2.6 from uh, minus 1.5%. Uh, However, in my opinion, this is unlikely to dent, to hurt uh, the broader market sentiment. In China, the coronavirus uh, spreading has eased uh, and uh, economic activity in the world's second uh, largest economy may start to recover slowly uh, from now on, at least uh, as long as we don't have uh, second wave of exponential uh, spreading in the coronavirus. During the European session, Norway's GDP for the first quarter is coming out. Expectations are for the headline print uh, to show that the economy contracted 1.5% uh, quarter over quarter after expanding by the same percentage in the last three months of 2019. However, the mainland GDP is forecast to have accelerated to 0.3% quarter over quarter from 0.2%. Now, in any case, we doubt that this uh, release will have a material impact on policy, on not just bank uh, policymakers' uh, view over monetary policy, um, because on May the 7th, they already decided to cut interest rates uh, to zero, and they said that uh, rates will most likely remain at uh, that level for uh, some time ahead. So they want to keep interest rates near zero percent uh, for uh, and for uh, the forthcoming horizon they it, this means that they are not in favor of negative rates and even if uh, we get a soft gdp release we don't, i don't believe that uh, this will have a material impact on on officials view around uh, monetary policy now in the US, in the US we get uh, the CPIs for April on Tuesday. Headline inflation is expected to have slowed to 0.4% from 1.5%, while the core rate is, an is anticipated to have declined to 1.7% from 2.1%. Okay, the tumble in the headline uh, rate, uh, given that the tumble in the headline rate appears to be more severe than in the core one, this suggests that uh, the fall in the headline rate may be mainly owed to the collapse in oil prices. You can see that the year-over-year -year 
change in WTI prices, the black dotted line here, uh, tracks very well the spread between the headline and the core uh, and the core uh, CPI rates. Uh, the spread is the gray histogram uh, here. So uh, a tumble in the headline rate and uh, uh, which is larger than the core uh, rate suggests that this is mainly due to oil prices. However, the core rate, if it slides to 1.7 from 2.1 percent, it will be below the Fed's objective of 2% and could keep the door open for further easing. The Fed appears to be willing uh, to ease further. They said that they are unlikely to run out of uh, ammunition. And an important development is that last week, even the yields of the Fed fund futures turned negative. This means that there are some investors who believe that the Fed could make the exception and cut interest rates into negative waters, despite the committee never being in favor of the negative uh, rates uh, regime. So we have an interesting development here. The Fed has never been in favor of uh, negative rates. They've never cut rates into the negative territory, but the yields of the Fed fund futures suggest that some investors believe that this is a possibility uh, this time around with the coronavirus uh, spreading. Specifically, I think, the, Fed fund, the yields of the Fed Fund futures have, uh, the first yield that turned negative is on December, uh, on December this year, while there is a 62% probability for, an, uh, for negative rates, for the Fed to cut negative rates, in, uh, to cut rates into the negative territory um, in, during the summer of uh, next year. But uh, for sure, it remains to be seen whether the economies will start to recover uh, from the coronavirus spreading, or will we have a more severe contraction ahead of us? Now, on Wednesday, during the Asian morning, we have a central bank deciding on interest rates, and this is the RBNZ. A couple of weeks ago, the Kiwi came under strong selling pressure after Westpac, the Westpac said, uh, the Westpac bank said it expects the RBNZ to cut interest rates to minus 0.5% in November a move that could be telegraphed as early as in August. Most importantly, they noted uh, that they expect officials to double their QE program to 60 billion New Zealand dollars at this gathering, the one we have on Wednesday. So, that said, last week the employment data for uh, the first quarter came in better than expected. The unemployment rate ticked up to 4.1% from 4%, while uh, the forecast was for a rise to 4.3%. The employment change showed a 0.7% gain in jobs instead of a 0.3% uh, decline as the forecast uh, suggested. So this may have alleviated some pressure for policymakers to act again as soon as at this gathering, but it still remains to be seen whether they will decide to double their QE purchases at this meeting or not. In case they do, if we indeed get uh, uh, an expansion of uh, QE purchases, the queue is likely to come under renewed selling interest and could either underperform its Australian counterpart, which means Aussie Kiwi could drift uh, north. Uh, the Aussie could stay supported due to the improvement of the, broker, of the broader market sentiment, as well as due to monetary policy divergence. Remember that last week, the RBA kept interest, interest rates unchanged, but announced that it has scaled back the size and frequency of its uh, bond purchases. So, on the one hand, we have the RBNZ, which um, is expected, let's say, to expand its QE at some point and to cut interest rates into the negative territory in the months to come. And on the other hand, we have the RBA keeping rates unchanged, saying that uh, they are now at their effective lower bound, which means that they are not willing to cut the rates further, in, further from uh, the current level of 0 .20, 0 0.25. And they have also scaled back, which means reduced their QE uh, purchases. So we have divergence in monetary policy here, which could uh, propel the Aussie Kiwi pair uh, higher. Now, as for Wednesday's data, 
during the Asian trading on Australia's wage price index for the first quarter is, uh, is coming out. Expectations are for wages to have grown by 0.5% quarter over quarter, the same pace as in uh, the fourth quarter of 2019, something that would take the year over year rate a tick lower to 2.1% from 2.2%. Now, in our view, downtick in the year-over-year -year rate is unlikely to prompt RBA policymakers to scale up their QE purchases, although they noted they could, they could do so if deemed necessary. But with the spreading of the coronavirus leveling off, they may continue to scale back their program if uh, data continue to allow, uh, continues to allow so. Now, during the European day, we get the first estimate of the UK GDP for the first quarter. Expectations are for, economic, for the economic activity to have contracted 2.5% quarter over quarter after stagnating in the last quarter of, 2000, of 2019. This will drive the year over year rate down to minus 2.1% from plus 1.1%. Last week, the Bank of England the Bank of England kept its monetary policy unchanged, but noted that the current QE is set to reach its target at the beginning of July. This, combined with uh, officials' readiness to take further action if needed, suggests that uh, QE expansion may be on the cards for the months to come. So they are reaching their uh, QE target in July. It's too early to stop QE, so they may announce in the months to come an expansion of uh, that target. Uh, also, they, they said in the statement accompanying the decision last week that they remain ready to take further action if needed. So, probabilities here are for more QE by the Bank of England in, in the months to come. Now, with the bank also projecting a 14% tumble, tumble in the GDP for the whole year of 2020 and with Governor Bailey speaking about a 35% drop in uh, the activity of the second quarter, a better than expected uh, print for the first quarter is highly unlikely to alter the bank's plans for further stimulus in the months to come. So even if we get a better uh, GDP number this week for the first quarter, I don't believe that this will change the outlook around the Bank of England's monetary policy. Thus, even if we get a better print, we see the case for any potential rebound in the pound to stay limited and short-lived. The nation's uh, business investment for the quarter, as well as the industrial production and trade balance for the month of March, are also due to be released. So, alongside the GDP, we have business investment, industrial production, and trade balance. Uh, now, from Sweden. From Sweden, we have the CPIs for April on Wednesday. In both the CPI and CPIF rates, the CPIF rate is, uh, is the inflation rate which is conditioned upon interest rates staying at the current, at the, uh, at the current uh, level. So, uh, both the CPI and CPIF rates are forecast to have tumbled to 0.1% year over year from 0.6%, a notable slide. That said, we prefer to pay more attention to the core CPIF metric, which excludes uh, the volatile items of energy. So, if we take into account the tumble in oil prices last month, uh, headline inflation rates around the globe may, f may fall notably. So, a better indication of, uh, of underlying inflation is uh, maybe looking at core rates. So, we will look at the core CPIF metric uh, again. Uh, but let's note that there is no forecast for this metric. In March, that rate ticked down to 1.5% from 1.6%, suggesting that the slide in the headline rates was due to the collapse in energy prices. So if we get another downtick in the core CPIF rate, this would point that the headline rates fell for the same reasons in April, and uh, this is unlikely to urge uh, RICS bank policymakers to cut rates back to the negative, uh, back to negative waters soon. Uh, I remind you that the negative rates in Sweden are, are at 0%. For officials to start thinking the possibility of negative rates, a notable slide in the core CPIF rate may be needed. So, uh, I believe that uh, traders of SEC traders should pay more attention to 
uh, the core CPIF rate than the headlines one. Now, from the Eurozone, we get industrial production for uh, March, and from the US, we have the PPIs uh, for April. Eurozone's industrial production is expected to have fallen 12% month over month after sliding 0.1% in February, while the headline US PPI rate is expected to have declined to minus 0.4% from plus 0.7%. The core rate is forecast to have slid to 0.9% year over year from 1.4%. Now moving to Thursday, on Thursday, during the Asian day, we get Australians employment report for April. The unemployment rate is expected to have risen to 8.3% from 5.2%. This will be much, fair, much higher than the 4.5% threshold that the RBA believes it will start generating inflationary pressures. The net change in employment is anticipated to show that the economy has lost 575,000 jobs after gaining only 5.9 thousand in March. Now, with the RBA policymakers scaling back their QE purchases, it would be interesting to see whether a soft employment report would be a reason for them to stop doing so. Uh, that said, our own view is that officials are aware that the data for March and uh, that the data for March and April uh, may come on the soft side, and still they decided to scale uh, to scale back their QE purchases last week. So, with the spreading of the coronavirus keeps slowing down and governments around the globe easing their restrictions, we think that the prospect of better days may allow them to continue reducing their bond purchases. Uh, later in the day, we get the, we get Germany's final CPIs for April, but as, always, as it is always the case, they are expected to confirm their preliminary estimates, so I don't believe that this would be a major market mover, maybe not at all. And finally, on Friday, Asian time, we have China's fixed asset investment, industrial production and retail sales or for April. Fixed asset investment is expected to have fallen at a slower pace than in March minus 7% from minus 16%, while industrial production is expected to have rebounded 1.5% year over year after sliding 1.1%. Retail sales are expected to have slid 7.5% after falling 15.8% in March. So expectations here are for, uh, for declines, but at a slower pace than in March, which means that the situation in China, confirms what I've said earlier, that the situation in China is getting slightly better than it was in February and March. Uh, during the European morning, we get Germany's preliminary GDP for the first quarter and the second estimate of uh, GDP from the Eurozone as a whole. Germany's economic activity is expected to have contracted 2.1% after stagnating in the last three months of 2019, while for the bloc as a whole, the, the second estimate uh, is forecast to confirm that the euro area economy shrank 3.8% after expanding only 0.1% in the fourth quarter. Uh, okay, last week we saw the ECB uh, taking additional uh, easing measures. Uh, I think that policymakers are already aware of the contraction. We cut the first estimate already out. So the second estimate of euro area GDP likely to come as a confirmation and is unlikely to be a surprise uh, to euro traders. In the US, we have retail sales for April. The forecast uh, suggests that the headline, that headline sales fell 11.6% month over month after falling 8.4% 8, 8 in March, excuse me. While the core rate is anticipated to have declined to 8 po minus 8.6%, month over month from uh, minus 4.2%. So we have further and more severe declines in retail sales, uh, in the US retail sales uh, for the month of April. So the situation in the US continues to be a bad one. And uh, this alongside uh, the slowdown in the CPIs may keep the door wide open for further easing by the FOMC. So this will make it more likely that we will get additional easing measures. Industrial production for April is also due to be released along the preliminary University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index for May. Industrial production is anticipated to have fallen 
11.5% month over month after declining 5.4% 5. 5. in, uh, in March, while the University of Michigan index is expected to have uh, slid to 68.5 from 71.8. So that's it uh, from me. Thank you very much for watching and listening. I don't know if you have any questions. Do, do we have any questions with regards to uh, the weekly outlook, the events uh, that are coming out? I will leave you a few seconds. Uh, if you have any questions, type them down. Okay, we don't have any question, so that's it uh, from me. Thank you very much for watching and listening. I hope you have a great week, and I'm looking forward to seeing you here again uh, next uh, Monday. Now, if you are interested in more detailed and frequent analysis, uh, you can find me on our YouTube channel from Tuesday to Friday at around uh, 7.30 a.m. GMT time. So, goodbye, have a, a great day, and a greater week. Thank you very much. JFT, just fair and direct.